This is a relationship that breaks every rule in the book. Some of the most dangerous predators on our planet, accepting a human into their pride. Then we get the feeling you've been surrounded by lions. <laughs> I get it every day. It has taken Kevin Richardson years of patience and dedication to build this unique bond. Come, 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 come. Let's go. But keeping predators in captivity is fraught with difficulty. An angry lion needs help. A hyena cub is saved from certain death. Maybe come up with and when lions meet, they clash. All while Kevin tries to keep his dream alive. I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. On the banks of the Crocodile River lies Kevin Richardson's 700 hectare private predator sanctuary. Home to lions, hyenas, and leopards. Known as the Kingdom of the White Lion, the park was established in 2005 for the making of a feature film. Now the movie is finished, there's no reason for the kingdom to exist. Unless Kevin can find another method to make it pay its way, the park and the animals will be sold. Kevin has dedicated the last 12 years to the lives and well-being of these animals. With their close bond, many are like his best friends. For him, turning his back on them is not an option. With a park that's running at capacity, it's vital that the animals share enclosures. But there is one lion that throws a wrench in the works. The star of the feature film, Thor, seems to have the usual trademarks associated with a movie star. Cravings for attention, the constant desire to look the part, and the diva-like tantrums. Well, Thor is a very temperamental lion. <laughs> In fact, uh, sometimes even I find it a little bit tricky to read his mood. He can be the happiest, most friendly lion, and then like that, he can also be a lion that will want to uh, attack you over a rock that he wants to take possession over. Now, all lions, as we know, love their food. However, Thor <laughs> wants to kill you even before you've given him the food. So Thor can be quite a tricky cat. There's a tragic sting to his tail. Lions are the only truly social cats, but after two years working on the movie, there was never a suitable cat that Thor could live with. Kevin worries for Thor's happiness and spends much of his time stepping in as a feline friend. So one of the few lions that actually really enjoys me to stick my finger right in his ear canal. <laughs> and I'm not bulldusting you when I tell you my finger's almost tickling his brain. When lions are in a group, they would groom each other and they lick their, each other's ears. So kind of like I use this brush, they would use their tongues and in they go. Now Thor obviously is not with anyone, so I've got to spend extra time just loving and grooming and bonding, and, and that's why I brush him. To provide Thor with stimulation, Kevin takes him for walks in the wild bush area surrounding the lion enclosures. It's home to, among others, giraffes, wildebeest, and impala. Finding a suitable partner hasn't been easy, but Kevin's had a breakthrough. We finally found some suitors for Thor. Uh, two lionesses, Kasasa and Sabindi. He doesn't know it yet, but in a couple of days' time, he's going to be introduced to the lovely, tawny females. Hey? We've decided that they would uh, suit Thor just fine. We're going to put them on the pole. Um, because we really don't want to be breeding any more lions over here at the kingdom, eh? But you'll still get the company. It'll be nice. 
On the other side of the kingdom, in the Hyena clan, there's trouble. Mother Matriarch Gina has been fighting for dominance with her daughter, Oslo. Their power struggle ended in murder as they cannibalized each other's cubs. There's just one survivor, and Kevin has had to take drastic action. This is the only surviving little cub, and I've had to remove him now because out of five cubs, we've now landed up with nothing. I think we're going to have to take you and hand raise you, my little guy. The responsibilities that come with taking a youngster away are tremendous because now you are basically becoming its mother. So you immediately start thinking about the future. Where is he going to go uh, once we've raised him to a level where he doesn't need to stay with us 24-7? A hyena is usually thought of as a vicious scavenger, and it's uncommon for them to be bred in captivity. It's even more rare for them to be hand-raised. <laughs> Here we go, my boy. You don't want to stop for a burp then, boy? Hmm? <laughs> You're a greedy cat, that's why. You eat too quickly. You eat too quickly, my boy. Eat too boop, 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 boop. I can feel all that air. Your stomach's hard, man. You need to get rid of that air. Okay, okay. <laughs> can you eat like a milkshake? Hmm? Unable to defecate by themselves, a hyena mother would stimulate bowel movement in her cubs. But without mother around, it's up to Kevin to lend a helping hand. They don't have the, uh, the bowel movement or the ability to push it out um, on their own. So it'll come, it'll come in another week or two. And you can feel now he starts to push. Once the, oh, here he come. Oh, I can smell it. Not my favorite job, but one does get used to it. So after little Max, I think we're going to call him Max, <laughs> has had a good feed and relieved himself, um, it's a perfect time and opportunity to introduce uh, him to the dogs. Come, let's go and play. Cubs require constant socialization to prepare them for life back in the animal world. Over the years, Kevin has found help at hand on his own doorstep. You've seen uh, Valentino, I've seen many, many animals come through the house. So he's generally very good. <laughs> he's been... Valley, stop it today. Slowly, boy. That's how you call him back. Because that little high pitch is uh, that's something that we found over the years they respond to. They make those sounds. With an additional animal to occupy Kevin's time, there's another weight bearing on his shoulders. He needs fifteen to twenty thousand dollars each month just to break even. And without the facilities to welcome the paying public, it's becoming impossible for the kingdom to survive. At the moment our roads are not good enough and our facility, the, the safety of the facility in, in terms of bringing kids around is not safe. It's not, it's not up to spec. So we'd have to spend a fair amount of money on that and uh, yeah, so it's kind of like a vicious circle. It's like we need to spend money to make money. Kevin is depending on some of the profits from the movie, which helped establish the kingdom, to enable it to have a chance at a sustainable future. The coming weeks will be crucial, as Kevin waits to discover if the film's release will be able to help prevent the closure of his park. The recent brutal battle between mother and daughter in the hyena enclosure resulted in the death of cubs. To restore peace, Kevin has decided to send the feuding daughter, Oslo, and her brother, Barun, to a new home. At the break of dawn, park veterinarian Claire Speedy prepares to dart them, ready for their move to a private zoo in Southeast Asia. 
I'll try and get a side on for you. I mean, so you can get a, a backside. Nice one. For Kevin and Vet Claire, the priority now is to find Oslo. As Oslo's legs give way, Burun looks on nervously in the background. Just moments later, he too is stung by Claire's anesthetic dart. Okay, this is Oslo, and Oslo is obviously Gina's daughter. And she's the one that's been fighting with Gina a lot, although it's calmed down quite a bit lately. But uh, needless to say, it's going to flare up again. And the same goes for Baran. Baran is going to start breeding with his mother, basically, in a, another year or so. As they begin to look for Baran, it becomes apparent he's nowhere to be found. It's vital they quickly find the sedated animal. Unconscious, he could be in danger. Uh -uh. Let's check down here about the den. Let's do this, do this top half first. I think we've covered this area. Yeah. I've just looked right in that middle there. Claire asked me to look after the baron and I lost track of him and now we can't find him. And he's gone down. It's not good to have an animal that's drugged just running around. Well, not running around, as the case may be. Found it! Ah, uh, there's no way he was here when I came last. There's no way he was here. I came right past you. Okay, two, three. Up. A few hours later, Oslo and Barun are on their way to the airport, the start of a long journey. You know, you never like to see your animals go, but it's, a, it's the reality, you know, if the, if the numbers are getting too great and the complications with mother and daughter and mother and son, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a necessary thing we have to do and, uh, it, it does, you know, people say it gets easier, it doesn't. Um, at the moment they're calm, the ears are just going, what's that, what's that? So, I, I must say, uh, this is for me one of the worst parts about seeing these animals go, is just seeing what they have to go through to get to the new destination. But they seem calm, which is the main thing. As Oslo and Barun leave for their new home, Kevin is eager to get back to the kingdom to find out if peace has been restored in the hyena clan. The following day, Kevin visits the hyena enclosure to check on the mood. Now the troublemaker has left the clan. peeing in the water, you terrible thing. It's disgusting. How'd you get? How'd you get? <laughs> this clan has calmed down so significantly since Baran and Oslo have left to their new home uh, almost overnight. It was like the old days. So there's definitely something there with Oslo and especially Gina. Um, you know, that whole challenging for the throne, so to speak. The kingdom's nursery acts as a shelter for any of its abandoned animals. It's currently home to two lion cubs and five hyenas. Rodney Nambakana, Kevin's right-hand man, has gone there to collect orphan males Mafumu and Vietsi. The cubs have grown up together and share a bond like brothers. They've now outgrown the nursery and it's vital they join a pride of their own. Kevin and Rodney have a new pride of six young lions in mind. However, following an attempt to introduce Mafumu and Vietsi to the three rowdier members of this group,
complications arose. The Cubs were met with hostility. Kevin and Rodney have decided to reintroduce them to the unruly members individually in the hope that this will prevent bullying. They start with leader, Bandit. Oh, this should be interesting. Oh. Mafumu places a reassuring paw on his friend and takes charge. Be nice, Bandit. All get along nicely. Again, Mafumu dares to approach Bandit. Guys in to help, you see that? Slowly! Nicely, nicely, you see? No, 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 no. Tisha? I don't think he really wants to get into a ferocious fight. He's already got a nick on his lip from one of the little guys. So his posturing is. Look how bigger I, I look how bigger I am. I'm a big bandit, and I'll you know I'll put you in your place. And these guys are like, oh, he is back. Don't pick on us. And as soon as he makes a big noise, they roll on their backs, which is the submissive behaviour. I think we're going to have to just leave it for a while and let them all settle, just the three of them, before we start releasing more individuals into this group, because it can become complicated very quickly. So let's let's uh, let's hope it works out. Because if this doesn't work out, I don't know what I'm going to do. Kevin Richardson is not just passionate about his own lions, but is also involved in a conservation project to preserve wild predators. As a qualified pilot, he's received a request to help the sponsoring organization and heads 805 kilometers north to Botswana. Vango Delta lies the research camp for the Botswana Predator Conservation Trust. Set up to study the interaction between all the species of large predators in northern Botswana, it's coordinated by Andrew Stein. These things are living creatures and they have a place in this world and we need to understand uh, what they do, where they go, so that we can conserve them and make sure that life continues. Andrew has had difficulty finding the main pride. They're hoping to locate them from the air. Yeah, we're, we're quite close now. I've seen some vultures down here. Okay. So maybe, let's, let's see what we can see. Yeah, there's definitely something down there. Eh? Um, the vultures are all landing in that tree. Okay. And in front of the tree, I'm not sure what it is, but it, I, could, I could have sworn it looked like a giraffe carcass. I'm going to just do one more uh, circle around there. Okay. And see, see what, you know, maybe, maybe we're in luck. Eh? Maybe these lions have, have uh, made a kill. No, for sure, definitely. There's, I can actually see, I can actually see a lion on the carcass. There's definitely a giraffe kill there, dude. All right, great. Let's, uh, I'm gonna, let's just mark that. Let's get in there on the ground and have a look. Armed with their radio equipment and coordinates of the kill, they head into the bush to find the pride. As the sun reaches its midday peak, they finally catch their first glance of predator activity. Well, there's a carcass down there. It's quite old, eh? It's <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I can see him from here. <laughs> Having tracked the male, they cautiously move in closer to try and catch sight of other pride members. Go 
what are the dynamics of this pride? This is the largest pride that we're tracking. So right. there's six adult females. Um, there are nine subadults and then five cubs that are a year or less. And then the two uh, pride males. So it's one of the largest. Kevin tries to prevent his own lions from breeding, but the story in the wild is vastly different. Numbers are plummeting, and it's estimated there's been an 80% drop in less than 30 years. Although Kevin has a close bond with his own hand-raised lions, it would be a death wish to attempt physical contact with any others. Thanks to Kevin's help, Andrew is able to rediscover his main pride and keep his conservation efforts on track. Early the next day, Kevin returns to South Africa. But there is a dark cloud looming over the kingdom. Everyone's been relying on the success of the feature film to save the day. The pressure of these expectations weighs heavily on Kevin as he awaits news of the film's commercial success. Cinema revenues are looking meager, and the financial situation is about to take a turn for the worse. Um, the movie's been pirated, along with a whole bunch of other South African releases that have been on circuit. And it's just so irritating. I mean, you work for so many years to put, out, put something out there, and then some, I don't even have the word for it, uh, comes along and just cribs it and puts it on the street for, you know, a fraction of the price. The consequences are far-reaching. Uh, and it goes as far as the kingdom because if, if the movie did well on you know combined theatrical DVD TV we you know the, the the situation would look a lot brighter here pressure is mounting and unless Kevin can find a way of raising much needed cash the future of the kingdom's residents looks bleak if, if a film you know for whatever reason now doesn't get out there um, the consequences are that the park might have to shut down and we might be having to find homes for 37 lions, 20 odd hyena and the rest of the, you know, the animals that live here. There is no easy solution. Um, lions will only be bought up where there's a demand and in, at the moment I don't think there's much demand for lions. So quite frankly I think unless, you know, somebody really came in here and bought them out, uh, putting them down would be, you know, a, a real option. Sisters Kusasa and Sabindi's move to join Thor, the lonesome bachelor lion, is imminent. The vets have arrived to tranquilize the lionesses and administer long-term birth control. It doesn't take long for the drugs to take effect. And then they're fitted with a contraceptive implant. The device inserted behind their shoulder blades will ensure that they're unable to conceive for up to three years. The vets have another pressing procedure to carry out. Some of the lions have suffered from a mysterious outbreak of wart-like growths, which they're in the process of diagnosing. One of those affected is Kusasa. Secure in Thor's pen, the vets move quickly to remove the growth before she comes round. So Thor is clearly not happy, and it's because there's a lot changing in his life. He's moved enclosures, uh, now these two lions that he can see and smell in, the, in his in enclosure, and we are all here really irritating him. It's a delicate procedure. A wrong incision could sever a nerve ending. The removed growth will be sent to the laboratory for analysis in the hope of determining the cause.
As the lionesses sleep off the drugs, Thor still seems disturbed by their presence. In less than 24 hours, they will be joining this angry cat. Meanwhile, Kevin and his wife Mandy think they've found a new plan to keep the park from closing. We've had a lot of inquiries into people who just wanted to come out and help on the farm. So we thought, why not, you know? Um, let's get the volunteers through here. They can contribute in a, in a positive way. And it can also help, um, you know, fund some of the things that we need to do here, you know? With a new baby in the family, Mandy in particular is looking at future ways for the park to support itself. It's not just about the income that international guys will pay to come through to us. It's about the, the working hands that we have on the farm. Um, there are other things we are exploring to do with corporates and things like that at a later stage. But, um, you know, every little bit counts towards running a big park like we have. At Thor's enclosure, the bachelor is about to meet the two lionesses for the first time. Kevin takes no risks before releasing Kusasa and Sabindi. Thor's still very aggressive. So I've had to bring the, the dart gun out and um, mix up some drugs for um, Thor, just in case I have to dart him um, to prevent him really tucking into these girls. So if it's uh, getting out of hand and I feel that I might have to intervene, then this is, this is what this is for. Fur is going to fly. I think people need to be aware of that. These are lions. They're not humans. And they have their own way and their own mechanisms of establishing hierarchy. One thing's for sure is Thor has to assert his dominance. And that's what he's going to do. Sure enough, Thor is living up to his temperamental reputation as he eyes up the new arrivals slowly coming round in his night pen. Prepared for the worst, Kevin opens the hatch, allowing the lionesses to run out. But true to his unpredictable ways, Thor seems indifferent to their presence. Despite Kevin's anxieties, the girls don't seem too concerned with their new roommate. As soon as food arrives, it's the perfect opportunity for Thor to show off his dominance. But on this occasion, he's met his match, as Kusasa grabs the lion's share. In the wild, um, this, is, this kind of behavior is what you would expect. If a male lion came across two females in the bush, uh, he's a bachelor male roaming, it's not in his best interest to, you know, engage them immediately, because if he gets injured, that's the end of it. That could be the end of it. You know, from a, a wild perspective, Thor's behaving normal. Establishing a hierarchy will take some time, but in this encounter, the lionesses appear to be dominating. In another enclosure, Kevin faces a dilemma. Brothers Tao and Napoleon have spent their lives together. They're the oldest lions and the first that Kevin hand raised. At 12 years old, they're very much senior citizens, but can still keep their cubs in line and have a way with the ladies. But there's a problem with the mother of the group, dominant female Maddie Tao, who looks to be carrying cubs. With a lack of resources, more cubs could bankrupt the kingdom. She is quite a big eater, <laughs> so she doesn't really watch her diet. But more than that, I've seen that the actual girth of her body is, is a lot wider. So I'm a little bit perplexed, I'm not quite sure whether she is carrying or whether she's just a little bit overweight. We have had it before with Maddie Tao that just when we thought she wasn't pregnant, out popped some cubs.
Maddy Tao has been separated from the pride. Fitting her with a new contraceptive implant is the only option. It will ensure she can't conceive, but also won't damage any existing fetus. Vet Jonathan Fish darts her. She does look quite wide. Um, her back, her girth, when the, when the lines generally fall pregnant, they increase in size from here to here. She's fat. She's fat. Don't call her fat. Shame, Eddie Tao. You're just uh, well fed. Kevin remains convinced she's pregnant. Only time will tell who's right. There's danger at the Kingdom of the White Lion. The lives of the many other animals in the park's bush area are at constant risk from poachers. Poaching is a huge problem for wildlife parks in South Africa, and the Kingdom is not immune. Rodney is on poaching patrol. During a recent search, they found 20 traps, all intending to kill their animals. One side of the park has got fences and one of the side of the park has got uh, the river, which basically makes us very vulnerable to, um, to poachers because they've got um, clean access or easy access through the park, uh, so to speak. And also because the animals, this is where they like to drink. It doesn't take them long to discover a potentially lethal snare. There's a, a game path here, so usually the poachers will like to put the snares where the animals um, walk through and basically the animal without seeing the snare would basically walk through the snare and you can see this here is the snare here at this at this height would probably get caught in the in the neck and uh, the more the animal pulls away the snare closes and just suffocates it today they remove just one snare but the risk of poachers is an ever-present threat in the park. Back in the teenage lion enclosure, there's an animal that appears to be out of place. Spunnies has grown up with the lions and is a fully-fledged member of Bandit's Pride. As the kingdom's pretend lion, he's never met a fellow hyena. Kevin and Rodney have decided as the least threatening member of Bandit's troop, Spunny should be the next in the pride to be introduced to Mafumu and Vietzi. Despite Spunny's familiarity with lions, as soon as Mafumu and Vietzi arrive, he's being chased around the enclosure. But help is at hand for Spunny's when his old friend Bandit is released for his second encounter with Mafumu and Vietzi. Kevin's hoping it will be a more peaceful affair than last time. The group quickly settle down and form a truce. Kevin and Rodney now feel they can introduce Bandit's highly strung sister, Gabby. With backup in place, Spunny's confidence kicks in. Enraged. Gabby Riles Bandit, and both lay into Mafumu. Stop it. Stop it. I promise I'll warning you. I ta 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 ta. With tensions running high, 
Kevin has taken the controversial decision to intervene to try and settle the fighting lions. Gabby! Gabby! Nice! Nice, Gabby! <laughs> She's such a cow! With Gabby's vicious temper spurring on Bandit, Kevin and Rodney worry for Mafumu and Vietzi's safety. It's vital for the Cubs' survival that they come up with a plan B. It's an early start at the kingdom. After yesterday's failed introductions, Kevin and Rodney have another card up their sleeves. They're going to let Mafumu and Vietzi first form a coherent group with three of the calmer lions in Bandit's Pride. If this works, they will join the rest. We've got the five youngsters versus the three older lions. They stand a much better chance. Be nice. As time goes by, it's getting the tensions easing, it's getting easier and easier. Mafumo and Vayetu, you'll notice, are side by side, very still, very quiet, very low. Uh, and keeping a very watchful eye on what the other three are doing. Um, it's a good sign from them. It's been a successful morning for Mafumu and Vietzi. Kevin and Mandy's work has also paid off. The local volunteers are starting today. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite exciting, but also quite nerve-wracking from my perspective. There comes an added risk of now you've got extra people walking around the park, you don't know where they're sticking their hands, got big uh, predators in there that uh, can kill you. So there's always that in the back of my mind, you know, you, you, I, th I think 99% of it is pure logic, but you never know. Hello, hello. Hi. Uh, hello. Nice hello. to meet you. Yeah, you Pleasure. too. You too. Hi, I'm Kate. Kate, nice to meet you. Kate. Sorry. Yes. I'll nice forget all your names in a second. Renee. <laughs> Renee. Oh, okay. I won't forget that because it's my second name. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Welcome. <laughs> Taken, passing. Thank you. Oh, well, that's a good thing. Okay, thanks for all coming. Uh, it's really nice to have you all here. And uh, I hope you're going to enjoy your volunteering at the Kingdom. It's an exciting phase to be part of because one day, should the kingdom be this you know, world-class tourist facility, you guys can say, well, you know, I had a part to play. Following their induction, the volunteers are taken on a tour of the park and are eager to see Kevin interact with the animals. So Alex, Kaiser, Siam. Siam's a really fantastic tawny lion. Hello, Kaiser. Are you in a good mood today, boy? Oh. OK, so he looks like he's in a good mood. Kaiser, to, to give you an example, come boy, come Sammy, 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 oh, 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 oh. So lions will do everything in their time. There's no such thing as human time, and if you want to push them, then you've got another thing coming. You've got to just be patient and, you know, just uh, go with the flow. Come boy, yeah, yeah boy. Hola. Patience is indeed the order of the day. As Kevin's calls fall on deaf ears, he tries his luck with Thor. But again, to everyone's astonishment, he is completely ignored. As a last resort, he steps in with Meg and Amy. <laughs> who, true to form, give him a boisterous greeting. Free labor from local volunteers like these is invaluable. But if the park's going to survive, then Kevin and Mandy will have to come up with more radical plans. Following Lioness Maddie Tao's procedure to have a contraceptive fitted, it's been a waiting game to discover if she is pregnant or, as the vet thought, overweight. So Maddie Tao, <clears throat> it appears that she's a little bit overweight and she's not actually pregnant. Um, again, Gestation-wise, it's been over 120 days, and there's no signs of uh, cubs. So I think it's a little bit of a diet for, for Maddie Tao. 
Orphaned baby hyena Max has survived against all odds. Saved from the hyena den just days after his siblings were killed by their auntie, he's been hand raised by Kevin. It's now time for his first outing to the nursery. There he will meet Mafumu and Vietzi on a break from visiting the older lions and some curious young hyenas. Over there, my little pupa. Look at them. Don't be scared of them. They were once like you. They were once like you too. They know what it's like to be the smallest. Muff, 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 muff. Mafumu, the more confident of the two, wastes no time in making a friendly greeting. Yeah, look at this is going very well. This is going very well. Look at that. You've all been so nice. Hey? You've been nice. You're such a nice group of animals. Got such beautiful mm -hmm. natures. Yeah. Slowly. We all get so excited. Yeah. It's so exciting. All Woody's trying to do is exert her dominance. She's the, the oldest female here. So at this stage, she's the most dominant. Uh, Max is a little male, and she's just saying to him, listen, I'm the boss here. So if you come to my, my group, my clan, which involves two lions, I'm still the boss. Just as the youngsters settle down, Mafumu decides to show his affections. Break my back, man. <laughs> okay, get off me, my friend. <laughs> All right. It's enough. Bye bye. Bye, guys. I think Max has really done well. He's gone in there with the right attitude. Um, if he went in there with this aggressive, cocky attitude, then they would sort him out very quickly. He went in there all submissive and cute and, hey, how can they not like that cute face? Hey, I'm just a youngster, yeah. Yes, I just want to be accepted. <laughs> He's going to do just fine. He's a fantastic little guy. As life at the kingdom appears to settle down, there is about to be some tragic news. Cub Mafumu is dead. They will need to search for clues to solve the mystery of his death. In the meantime, his best friend Vietzi is left alone. 